Thank you, everybody. So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes talking about GDP. So if any of you wants to leave, <laughs> now's your chance. Um, I'm going to do this 15-minute uh, speech. Sorry, I'm going to do yeah this 15-minute speech in what normally takes me 40 minutes. So what you're about to witness, ladies and gentlemen, is a productivity miracle. Um, now, GDP is a complex uh, technical subject. I work for the Financial Times, so you would expect some charts. So bear with me. Uh, the first chart that I'm going to show you is a chart um, of the uh, partial composition of British GDP. <laughs> so in 2012, Joshua Abramsky and Steve Drew, who both were working for the Office for National Statistics, received an order. The order was they were to start counting prostitutes. Now, this may seem rather bizarre, but there was a rationale for this. So Eurostat wanted to measure GDP, the size of the economy, equally across Europe. But in some countries, like Holland, uh, prostitution was legal and therefore was counted as part of the economy. And in other countries, uh, it wasn't legal and therefore wasn't. So they wanted to standardize this. So Abramsky and Drew set about their task. Being statisticians, they headed for the library. Um, they found a, a, a study um, that, that had an estimate for the number of prostitutes working in London in 2004. They extrapolated this for the entire nation, and they worked out that there were 60,879, such exactness, uh, prostitutes working in, in Britain. They then had to work out what they were charging. Um, so they started surfing the internet. <laughs> they found themselves on punter.net, and I'm actually not making this up. And they found out that, um, that the average cost of a personal service uh, was £67.17. <laughs> I imagine the punter, like counting the fi you know, final pennies. Um, they then did exactly the same uh, uh, routine, the same exercise um, for drugs. Uh, they counted heroin, cocaine, uh, crack cocaine, amphetamines, ecstasy, and marijuana. So if your drug of choice is not on that list, you're really not doing your part for the British economy. <laughs> they found that uh, prostitution and drugs were contributing £9.7 billion to the British economy. So the more of these activities, uh, the better. <laughs> Why do I go into this sort of rather bizarre story? Um, well, the first is there is no computer in the sky working out all our transactions. Um, GDP, gross domestic product, is an estimate. It's compiled through surveys, questionnaires, guesstimates. The second thing is that it's rather arbitrary. That fly again. In the, in the, in the UK, we count um, crime as part of the economy. In America, they don't. So in America, all that cocaine they're snorting from Colombia is not counted as part of the economy. In Colombia, it is pound, uh, counted as part of the economy. I mean, after all, if they didn't count it, there wouldn't be much of an economy to count. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a joke. <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, why is this so important? It's important because we live on planet GDP. GDP is how we measure the economy. And uh, the economy is, you know, how, how fast the economy is growing is a sort of a national obsession. You know, whether it grew last quarter, whether it grew last year. And we measure the economy with this thing called uh, GDP. Now, no politician in Britain or anywhere else would knowingly damage the economy. They would never stand up and say, I'm going to do policy X, but that might damage the economy. And yet, until 1950, the word economy with its modern meaning was never used in a political manifesto in Britain. In the 2015 Tory party uh, manifesto, it was used nearly 80 times. GDP has become the denominator of choice. We look at GDP, for example, debt to GDP determines how much a country can borrow and at what interest rates. Um, there was a discussion in Britain uh, a few years ago about whether we should cut defence spending to below 2% of GDP. And the Financial Times received a letter. I happen to have it in my pocket. Um, uh, the letter, I imagine it came from, or I like to imagine it came from a sort of retired colonel in Chipping Norton. And he said, Sir, 
The 2% of GDP NATO benchmark to which you refer is surely a very strange way in which to calculate a country's defence budget. Applying this criterion to the UK has meant that the targeted expenditure figure has recently risen as a result of prostitutes' earnings and the composition of illegal drugs being included in the composition of GDP, which seems mildly ridiculous. If only prostitutes worked a bit harder, the army could have a few more guns. <laughs> Growth is a modern invention. When FDR was elected uh, US president in 1933, he wanted a measure of the economy because he wanted to spend money to get the American economy out of depression. But hard as it is to believe today, there was no such measure. Uh, he had things like freight car loadings, the stock market was in the tank, unemployment. So he set this man, this brilliant statistician called Simon Kuznets, who went around the country uh, with a small team. And they came out with a document in 1934, which was to change the face of economics. Buried in this document was a startling revelation. That revelation was that the American economy had halved in three years. This gave Roosevelt the sort of empirical evidence he needed to double down on the New Deal. But even in his moment of triumph, Kuznets had various misgivings, serious misgivings, about his invention. First of all, he wanted to subtract some things from GDP. He wanted to take away armaments because he figured these were not contributing to human welfare. Unfortunately for him, GDP became very important in the run-up to the Second World War, and he lost that battle. He wanted to take away financial speculation because he figured that shuffling bits of paper around should not be counted as true, genuine economic activity. Uh, he also lost that battle. And if we think about um, the run-up to the 2008 financial crisis, more's the pity. Um, Kuznets, above all, thought that GDP should never, ever be confused with well-being. But I would argue that in our public discourse, that is exactly what we do. We use it as a proxy for, what, for the success of our societies uh, and our nations. Uh, GDP measures everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It measures, it measures armaments, it measures um, uh, heroin, and it measures pollution. In fact, pollution is doubly good for GDP because we measure it when we make it, and we measure it when we clean it up. So the more plastic we can produce and chuck in the oceans, the better. A GDP does not like housework. Here at last, I found some, something that I can agree with. Um, GDP does not count anything for which money doesn't uh, change hands. So if you're looking after an aged relative at home, you are not contributing to the economy. However, farm that aged relative out to an old people's home, and uh, when money changes hands, then suddenly you're a productive member of society. Um, GDP is an aggregate. It tells you nothing at all about distribution. There's an economist joke. Being an economist joke is not very funny, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> Um, so Bill Gates walks into a bar, everyone on average is a billionaire. Uh, averages are very misleading. Um, so the American economy has grown on average for year after year after year after year, but median household income in the US has got stuck in the 1970s. Uh, in the last nine years, uh, GDP has grown successively in the US economy every single year. In the last two years, life expectancy actually fell. Ah, that one shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, GDP is very poor at measuring haircuts. Uh, why should that matter? Because 80% of our economies are haircuts, services. GDP was in, uh, invented in the manufacturing age. It's good at measuring chairs, and it's good at counting steel, things that you can drop on your foot. But it's very bad at healthcare, um, at banking, uh, landscape gardening. Um, at least GDP ought to be good uh, at measuring innovation. Well, I would argue that GDP is lousy at measuring innovation. Let's take, for example, antibiotics. A uh, hundred years ago, a billionaire would have given half his fortune uh, for a course of antibiotics. Could, it, could, it, could have saved his life. Um, today, those antibiotics are worth pennies. They've dropped out of GDP, and yet, of course, every bit is valuable. This becomes even uh, more preponderant in the internet age. So take Wikipedia. All human knowledge, practically, for free to anybody with access to the internet. Its contribution to the global economy, zero.
So I've told you a lot about what's wrong with GDP. Let's think about this uh, in a different way. Um, let me tell you sort of a bit about um, Bill and Ben. So Bill is a banker. He earns £500,000. All right, he's a very poorly paid bank banker, but, uh, you know, bear with me. Um, Ben's a gardener. He earns £25,000. Who is richer? Well, of course, you'd say Bill is richer. But I've only told you about the GDP of Bill and Ben. I've only told you about their income. I've told you nothing about their wealth. I may have forgotten to mention uh, that Ben uh, inherited from his great aunt Edna an estate last year worth 100 million pounds. Uh, he works in the garden on weekends, uh, just as a bit of a hobby, pays himself a nominal salary. Um, next year, he's going to move into a flat in Mayfair, you know, modest, five million pounds, and live off the remaining 95 million pounds for the rest of his life. Um, Bill, meanwhile, has this unfortunate cocaine habit. Uh, terrible overdraft, behind on his mortgage payments. He doesn't know it, but he's pretty washed up. Uh, he's going to be out of a job next year when his bank moves the derivatives trading unit to Frankfurt. Brexit. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, and he's 54. Who looks better off now, Bill or Ben? And, and yet we have no... So what I've just told you there is, is the wealth of Bill and Ben. But we have no equivalent measure for nations. You wouldn't dream of investing in a company based on its profits last year. You'd want to know about its plant, its machinery, its workforce, so that we know how, many, how much profit it may make next year. But we do not do that with nations. There's no balance sheet of you know, natural capital, uh, infrastructure, uh, human capital. The World Bank, in fact, has just come out with a study... Um, of precisely that, um, a methodology for precisely that. And we can, we can now do that. And I would argue that, that the, the wealth of nations is something that we should be paying much more uh, attention to. Um, there's an experiment. You're a TED audience. You probably know this experiment. Two monkeys put side by side. And they hand over a pebble. Uh, and they're given a reward of a cucumber. And they're happy as Larry. Then one of the monkeys is given a grape, a much sweeter, tastier grape, at which point all hell breaks loose. Because the other monkey is suddenly enraged. It starts shaking the cage. It flings the cucumber um, back um, at the trainer. So why does this matter? Because it tells us, and all studies of happiness tell us, that happiness is not about how much income you have, but your income uh, relative to others. So once basic human needs are met, we are happier or sadder um, relative to how we're doing next to our, uh, you know, compared to our neighbours. Now that, in a sense, is a is a very depressing finding because it would suggest that all this growth that we're talking about is really sort of one-upmanship, and it would also suggest um, that we shouldn't take. Uh, this so seriously uh, that we see this as a, as a route to happiness but in fact we're working harder and harder for more and more but really feeling no more uh, fulfilled. Now, 10 years ago, um, Sarkozy, the former president uh, of France, said that if we do not see ourselves, our own lives, reflected in the official statistics, we become angry and that nothing can be more dangerous for democracy. In the age of Donald Trump 10 years later and Brexit 10 years later, I would argue um, that those are quite prescient words. So how could we do this uh, differently? Well, I'm not advocating get, getting rid of GDP, though some people do, nor am I adv um, advocating replacing it with kind of complex indices, though again, some people do. But what I'm um, advocating is something far simpler. I would like to downgrade GDP a bit and to elevate some other numbers that we can think about and put political weight behind. So I already mentioned sustainability. We have a measure, a proxy. It may be a rough proxy, but we have one. CO2 emissions. Imagine what our policies would look like if we took CO2 emissions as seriously as GDP. It wouldn't mean the end of GDP by any means. Um, what about another measure? How about median household income, how the economy is working for the ordinary person, not how the ordinary person is working for the economy. Um, how about um, healthy life expectancy? It's very simple. We can all understand it. Imagine if that were a target that politicians were held to as much as they were held to you know, this, 
increasing this arbitrary GDP measure, you could argue that you know, they'd have done a much better job at sorting out some of the problems uh, in the National Health Service. Kenneth Golding, um, an economist, divided the world into the cowboy economy uh, and the spaceman economy. The cowboy economy was ample resources for everybody and very few people. You could go around, you could chop down trees, you could kill buffalo as much as you wanted without making any effect. That is the world of GDP. But we don't live in the cowboy economy. We live in the spaceman economy. There, the objective is not to maximize uh, output. It might even be to minimize output. The objective is to raise the quality of life. But GDP is terrible at measuring quality. It's good at counting things. We live in the spaceman economy, but we're treating, we're measuring it as though we're li living in the cowboy economy. We're measuring modern societies and we're using a 10-gallon hat. Thank you very much.